Good evening, uh, good afternoon, or good morning, dependent on where you are, and a very warm welcome to this online event from the British Library, Alexander the Great, The Making of an Exhibition. My name is Scott McKendrick, and I have the privilege of not only being head of Western Heritage Collections here at the British Library, but also introducing this very special event that I'm sure you will find really fascinating. This is a unique chance to hear not just about a wonderful exhibition currently showing at the British Library until the 19th of February, but also about how it came about, the real inside story and directly from those who have brought it into being. There are other events linked to this exhibition, and if you find this one fascinating, then do uh, check out the British Library website for other events coming up over the next three weeks. For now, let me introduce the four curators who are here with us uh, today. There's Adrian Edwards, who's head of Printed Heritage Collections, Ursula Sims Williams, lead curator of Persian collections, Peter Toth, uh, curator ancient and medieval manuscripts, and finally Iria Thorstotir, who is digital content exhibition curator. After they've spoken in turn and Adrian has summed up, they will have time to answer questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please post it in the form below the video window, and I will aim to get through as many of these as possible. But without further ado, it's over to Peter, to Peter Toth, to get us started. Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Scott, and uh, good evening, everyone, uh, who decided to join us for this uh, special insight into the background and behind the scenes of the this exhibition, Alexander the Great, Making of a Myth. Uh, the topics we would like to touch upon in the, in the, in the forthcoming presentation is, uh, is a short survey about how the idea came about to do an exhibition about Alexander and how we developed it into an actual exhibition. Some uh, remarks and comments about uh, the delights and the difficulties of the process of putting the exhibition together will follow next. And after that, uh, there will be a, a short survey about digital aspects of the exhibition given by the right person to do this, the digital curator of the show, and then a short sum up about um, how it's going uh, right now with the exhibition. So in the next slide, I would like to give you an idea about uh, how the idea of an exhibition about Alexander came up. And the roots of the, of, of the show goes, uh, go back to quite early on in 1996, where the Brit uh, when the British Library had an exhibition called The Mythical Quest, which featured 10 quest tales from all around the world, including epics from the Middle East and classical Greece. And one of the sections of that exhibition included stories around Alexander the Great. And having that section, that chapter of the exhibition, convinced the curators of the show that the British Library has wonderful and rich material which would qualify for a show about Alexander only. And then the idea of having, a, having an exhibition devoted exclusively to legends, medieval and ancient and early modern legends of Alexander uh, was, uh, was raised at that time and has been floating around in the library for more than 20 years when it was given as a task in 2017 and 2018 to us to, to flash it out as an exhibition. In the next slide, we will see how uh, we were sure that this new exhibition cannot be about the historical Alexander, whose main dates and features are in this slide. We did know that it cannot be about the battles, the conquests of Alexander the Great, but it should be something else, which is on the next slide. Uh, we were sure that it cannot be uh, a historical exhibition because it has been done uh, in many ways and at many places already. And these exhibitions were always trying to find the historical Alexander in the extremely complicated forest of legends that surround his figure, trying to find the truth, the historical man behind the legends. Instead of doing that, we decided for something else. And for the first time ever, 
we decided to focus on the legends themselves on the next slide. We were sure that this exhibition, for the first time ever, will expose and highlight the incredibly amazing transformations of legends around Alexander, who was flying in the air with griffins. And it will be an exhibition about these legends in a comparative way, where various cultures and traditions which adopted these legends will be contrasted with, with each other. The first steps, how we approach this, is on the next slide. We decided that uh, to, to start with the extremely rich, li rich literature about the legends of Alexander the Great. So it was the secondary literature which uh, we first started to consult, and then various image libraries which contained and catalogued images derived from these legends. That was the next step. So we collected a lot of material about the legends and images and visual representations of the legends and Alexander them, uh, himself. And then having this incredibly rich material, we tried to translate it to the holdings of the British Library into our collections and see what exactly we have in the library's very rich and diverse collections. And then the next slide will give you an idea what we found after this. This was an extremely rich treasure trove of various things about Alexander from all across cultures and time. Comic books from the 20th century, Greek manuscripts from the ancient times, Japanese manga and anime series, music, and so much more, which was extremely surprising for us. But then we needed a thread, how to organize this extremely rich material. And the thread was found as it is exp um, uh, displayed on the next slide. The thread, instead of having any other concept to arrange the material, was the simplest one ever, the life of Alexander. We would be following the legendary life of Alexander as recorded in the medieval sources uh, and uh, exhibit various uh, scenes of his life in a comparative perspective. For example, as it's illustrated on this side, the conception of Alexander from a French print and another French manuscript, an Indian film and a Persian manuscript. This is how we uh, started to develop the concept. The next slide will give you an idea how complicated the process was. It was very clear from the earliest times on that this will be an exhibition where heritage items, if you, uh, if you go to the images with this slide, heritage items will be uh, displayed next to modern things. Just like here, you can see Arist uh, Alexander's education with Aristotle um, taken from various things, from an Arabic manuscript and from a modern film of Oliver Stone. This was one feature. The other was that many of the items are in bound books and manuscripts, so uh, they can, uh, there is only one thing we can show of a rich manuscript. Only one opening can be selected and all the other delights and beautiful things in that manuscript will have to be hidden. So we had to be very careful what opening we select from a manuscript. And another very interesting challenge was that uh, we were sure that the, the narrative will be twofold for this exhibition. We will be telling the story of Alexander's life, in this case, his education with Aristotle. But on another level, we'll have to tell the stories of the items themselves. We have to say what this Arabic manuscript represents and how important it is for the Arabic book illustration. We have to say something about the film, which was so controversial in its time. And we have to say something about the last items uh, uh, featured here, which is a, a 15th century manuscript, which was an ac actual uh, copy uh, dedicated to uh, the Queen of England which gives an actual and an additional uh, message and an additional meaning to the story of Alexander represented in this manuscript, which this, this twofold um, narrative, which will, you will see all along the exhibition was a, quite a complicated challenge uh, to face, which is why in the next slide, you will see how we, how, we, uh, how we face that, how we decided to face that. We have an excellent curatorial team set up exactly at this point. We have Adrian Edwards, who, were, who is the head of printed heritage collections, an expert of early uh, modern books and modern books as well. Uh, and uh, he advised us a lot about printed uh, novels and uh, modern things. We have uh, Ursula Sims-Williams, the lead curator of Persian collections working with us. 
who uh, uh, made an enormous contribution to the show by securing Oriental Middle Eastern material to the show. We had Iria, a uh, horse daughter with us, who looked after the very rich digital uh, legacy of Alexander and made sure that this is rightly displayed in the show. And we had a PhD student working with us who helped us at various bits and pieces of the exhibition. But to secure that everything is accurate on the next slide, you will see how we safeguarded the messages, the messaging of the exhibition. We set up an advisory board headed by our uh, Scott McKenvick, who is uh, kindly chairing this evening with us. And uh, Richard Stoneman was the main advisor in the group uh, and uh, another uh, series of experts. They all helped us to secure that what we say is rigid academically and trustworthy. This is how we, we started off the work about which uh, my colleague Adrian Edwards will give you an idea. Off to Adrian. Thank you, Peter. Um, so if you look at the next slide, um, and so to the, 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 the lengthy task really of finding potential objects for display, building around the thread of the storytelling that we settled on. So the British Library has a lot of stuff, around 170 million physical items. How do you find Alexander-related books and manuscripts amongst all that? Well, between us, uh, we have about 80 years experience working with the collection, that's, that's the four of us. So we had some pretty good ideas where to start looking. And we did indeed spend a lot of time browsing the shelves in historical storage areas where many of the materials are, are arranged by format and language or subjects. You can see in the picture here, this is uh, the horizontal storage as it's called, where, where we've got uh, very large uh, books of engravings, uh, this being the uh, Atarin Mosque in um, Alexandria. But for the most part, it was about working through lists of potential items found by searching our own catalogues. If you put Alexander the Great into our catalog, you'll get a lot of hits. Um, trawling through specialist bibliographies, and yes, throwing Alexander-related search terms at full-text databases and picture libraries. But the main task was to read vast numbers of books and journal articles, making sure we followed up on the footnotes, read the introductions, got a sense of exactly what the writers had seen and what they'd not found. We did look at what other exhibitions have shown, but they were overwhelmingly interested in finding the historical Alexander rather than the later stories, so they were only of limited help. The really important thing, though, was talking to experts. Peter mentions the uh, advisory board, but there were many other people, including academics, curators at other institutions, um, collectors of Alexander, uh, Alexander memorabilia, and indeed uh, creators. Next slide, please. It's a relatively uh, easy task to find books and manuscripts that reference Alexander, but what we needed was to find an engaging mix that fitted certain criteria. There were content considerations. We were looking for stories from throughout Alexander's life, even though there seemed to be more that relate to particular periods, such as his campaigns in Asia and his mythical quest. We wanted to show stories that ranged from the possibly true, such as his magnificent funeral hearse, through to the pure fiction, like his flight through the air. We also wanted examples from all around the world and from different periods in time. So these considerations may have also applied if we were thinking of illustrating an academic book, but as this is an exhibition, we also had to think about physical considerations. So most items have to be visually interesting. A gallery that comprises just pages of black and white text is not very appealing for paying visitors. And the objects need to require little or no conservation work before they can be displayed. There is no point in us, in us choosing lots of items that need extensive paper repair. We neither have the money nor the time to undertake this. We wanted a mix of formats, shapes and sizes to create variety and change of pace. Hence, for example, the suit of armor, which you may have seen. But then again, we didn't want too many very large items. Um, most really do have to fit comfortably into the standard exhibition display cases. 
Um, th there is a budget for building bespoke cases, but it's limited. And there are other constraints too. The book or manuscript needs to be available for the period of the exhibition. So not needed for teaching or for a digitization project or for display elsewhere. And as Peter has already mentioned, you can only show one opening from a book or a manuscript. Many of the items we chose were absolutely full of fantastic illustrations and could have been used to illustrate multiple stories. We had to choose one and there was a lot of debate around that, the exact uh, way in which we used each object. Um, on the next sl slide, please. Um, there are practical considerations that come from the gallery. So the size of the gallery is all important in determining the number of stories that can be covered and indeed how many objects can be displayed. So our Packard One Gallery has a floor space of 420 square metres. That's room for about 30 to 45 cases and a total of around, let's say, 120 described objects. In our exhibition, where we were thinking of showing each story illustrated by several items, two, three or four objects to show the same story, but from different cultures and times, um, if you work out the, the, the arithmetics around that, that leaves us to about 40 stories that we could cover. With so much available material focused on the stories around Alexander's campaigns in Asia, this is where we had to be most ruthless and choose just a few. We decided, for example, not to talk about Alexander and the Gordian Knot, nor his siege of the city of Tyre. It'd be interesting to hear what you think about that. There were also stories we wanted to show, but failed to find suitable objects for, at least suitable objects for an exhibition environment. The, ex the Alexander tradition in West Africa is an example of this. Alexander is cited as a role model for Sunjata Keita, the 13th century founder of the empire of Mali. But these are oral histories. And despite initial excitement at finding a Sunjata graphic novel, it turned out not to mention Alexander at all. <laughs> so we had discussions with colleagues at the School of Oriental and African Studies, but in the end, we had to give up on including this aspect in the exhibition. Um, on the next slide, um, we talk about loans, inward loans. So it's the usual practice and expectation of major exhibitions of this kind that we borrow a few key items. The purpose of this is to fill gaps in the storyline add variety of pace by adding types of object that we generally don't hold in our own institution, such as statues, and to show important treasures that might otherwise be missing from the story. Loans can also be helpful in attracting media attention. Usually the process of borrowing material is a long and involved one. We would go and look at the potential objects in reading rooms, galleries, or perhaps behind the scenes before entering into discussions with their curators, librarians, or owners, generally incorporating further visits. This couldn't happen during the preparations for Alexander because we were working during the periods of COVID lockdown. So most of the loans were arranged by email and video call. And sometimes we were surprised, nicely surprised, I should say, when we finally got to see the objects for real when they were brought here for installation. Several of our approaches to other organizations for loans, however, came to nothing. I think the lack of a personal relationship with the lender due to the COVID travel restrictions was behind most of these failures. But loans are, of course, expensive, even though all costs are covered by the borrower, like by us in this case, including any insurance, conservation work, transportation, courier expenses. Still, the overall resource commitment does put some lenders off. And at our end, I really must point to the um, efforts of our loans registry who uh, made all this happen for us. And they spend a lot of time on contracts and, and getting things measured and so forth. In fact, in, in Alexander, we ended up with what I thought was a fairly large number of loans, um, 36 objects coming from 20 lenders, some of them major institutions some smaller ones and a few private individuals. Unfortunately, the travel restrictions around COVID meant that they all ended up coming from Britain and Ireland, with the exception of two objects from Venice, from the Hellen Hellenic Institute for Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Studies. 
for which we were really fortunate in receiving a lot of assistance from the uh, Greek ambassador in London. And the next slide shows uh, what we ended up with. So this is the structure and the layout. Um, if you visited the exhibition already, you'll be familiar with it. It shows the stories as they relate to the stages of Alexander's life. So after an introductory area, we look at stories relating to Alexander's parentage in early years, then his career as a military leader, his relationships, his fantastical adventures with mythical beasts and flying machines and talking trees. And finally, the stories around his return to Babylon with his mysterious death and the even greater mystery around what happened to his body and the spectacular tomb at Alexandria in which the histories tell us it had been placed. The arrangement aims to make best use of the gallery space while allowing room for visitors to enjoy the objects, sit down in a few places and be surprised by what's through a doorway or especially at the end by the unexpectedness of what's around the corner. The design created for us by Drinkle Dean working with Lombard Studios uses a lot of colors fabrics and projections, the aim being to help get across that this is not a show about archaeology, but about storytelling and about going on a journey. The colours, in fact, are meant, subconsciously perhaps, to suggest dawn to dusk, mirroring Alexander's own life from birth to death. And on that note, I'll hand over to Ursula. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, now comes the difficult part, the process of selection. And we had room, as Adrian mentioned, potentially for a visual And we each had our own specialisms, bringing different sets of material to the drawing board. But an added complication was COVID, as we've mentioned. The library was closed for much of the time and we were working remotely without any access to the collections. So what did we do? Well, we met regularly on Teams and we used Google Slides and we shared the files for each of the six sections. And as an example, I'm showing you a screenshot of section three, Building an Empire. This was by far the largest sec section, and initially it included 87 items, which you can see some of in the left-hand column. We used the slide for an image of the item itself, and we also used the note area underneath for additional information on provenance and context and image source and so on. We found this very useful later. The final selection for this section, in fact, consisted of 40 items, so we whittled it down a fair bit. And in this next slide, I show you um, the subsection, which is of that section, Building an Empire, India and Beyond. And what we see here is how we were able to group the items together in experimental ways. And this actually is, is the final, these all got into the final show. But we see on the left the Battle of Porus and Alexander in, in a Mughal 17th century realisation and then somewhat different from a 15th century European perspective next to it, coupled with an archaeological coin of the, um, made to commemorate Alexander's victory. And on the right, um, we were able to bring in the um, autograph manuscript of Handel's opera Alessandro um, and also in the exhibition we, we have um, an audio point where you can listen to a recording of it. And then underneath Alexander Iskander engagement with Indian philosophy. So on the left side a Persian manuscript showing him meeting the Brahmins and on the right the same um, story Alexander and Dindimus, he's called, in a 17th century British publication. So now in the next slide, I'm showing you the actual 
object list. Well, because of COVID, we, we weren't really able to come up with a draft object list until towards the end of 2021. Um, we would, I think we would have hoped to have come up with it much sooner in normal circumstances. But here you see the final version with columns for image, title, author, date, media, registration number, and so on. And when we break down that final choice, we've actually got 144 objects about, more than the initial 120, but some are quite small. Um, We've got objects from 25 countries in 23 languages. And the British Library collections represent about 86, I counted, 86 items in the exhibition. And we've got 35 loans, or 36 loans, I think it is, in fact, um, from 19 different lenders. In terms of um, the breakdown between manuscript and printed material, we've got so 67 manuscripts and 38 printed items, which is a good balance. And also between Western and non-Western material, again, there's a very nice balance between the two. So we felt that the final choice reinforced the idea of a narrative shared through centuries and across cultures, which is really what we wanted to try and get across. So in the next slide, Having selected the items, this next slide shows how we had to tackle the accompanying documentation, making the panels and writing the labels. So space again was an issue. For the panels, we were charged with writing only 80 to 100 words and the labels should ideally only be 70 words. And here you see a, a model label. And as mentioned before, every layer, every label, every object could be interpreted in several different ways. The labels ideally would reflect the exhibition narrative, of course, but the object itself, and if it was a textual object, it needed to give the context that it, of the story, of the mess that it contained. It also needed to, um, give a convey a sense of the reception of the object, how it was viewed at the time it was written, and if possible, the provenance, where the object came from. So this, this was a problem um, and we tried to, to do our best. It was very difficult. Um, sometimes we had to emphasize some aspects as opposed to other aspects. But um, in the next slide, Fortunately, we were able to um, write a book, the book of the exhibition, and we could go into a lot more detail here. And um, it was quite challenging to, to have the, the task of writing a catalogue and the deadlines that we were up against. But on the other hand, it was incredibly useful because it really helped us to put all the objects into perspective in a way which we would have found very difficult otherwise. The um, catalogue was edited by Richard Stoneman of Exeter University, one of the world's leading authorities on the Alexander Romance, and he also acted as our main external advisor. And in addition to the nine illustrated essays, every object in the exhibition, except for one and a few others, is described in between two to 300 words generally. So that's a, a great um, improvement on the 70 of the labels. And we also were able to write extended contextual passages joining them up. And now I'm going to hand over to Iria to talk about the digital aspect. So, um, my colleagues have talked about some of the challenges of what to put in the exhibition and where. So I got to come and do what I think of as all the fun stuff. So I was looking at some of the film clips, the TV, the music that we've included, and that did come with some challenges. There are some uh, difficulties around rights when you're using uh, clips in a public space. We had some challenges. We wanted to show a clip from the film Alexander, the 2004 film directed by Oliver Stone. And it was a little challenging to 
clear that clip and it comes with a hefty fee to get such um, permissions. So we had to look for alternatives sometimes. And in this case, we used the film script instead. But we have managed to throughout the exhibition, I think we've got one in every section, something film related or documentary related music. We've got something AV in every section. And the whole exhibition actually opens with a, a clip that we've made, which is made up from different pictures of Alexander, most of which are in the exhibition. They are all portraying Alexander from a different culture. And you can actually see that before you enter into the exhibition. It's the first thing you see as you go down the stairs into the Packard Gallery. And then we have also had a little bit of fun with the exhibition through this. So we have large, what we've called, or what the designers called immersive thresholds in between each section. They're about six meters high and there's a projection above each. And the projection is to give a sense of what is to come in the next exhibition. So we have a beautiful one of the bust of Alexander turning round. We've got some swords clashing before the building and empire section. And we've been able to use these projections, not just in the gallery, but we're going to use them in other ways for other events at the library. So we're actually using the uh, projections for a, a storytelling session with children, for example. And we've used one of the very popular legends about Alexander, the talking trees, where Alexander goes to visit the talking trees to ask his fate, um, to turn that into an interactive. So you can actually come and almost a little bit of playtime in the gallery. So it's, it is family friendly. You walk in front of the trees and you move your arms to control the leaves and the tree of the sun and the tree of the moon interact with you and tell you a fortune. So it's, it's a really um, engaging way to just get a little bit of movement in the gallery. And then we finished off the exhibition. I, I'm so sorry, spoiler alert, if you've not been into the exhibition space already, uh, with a very pictured there, um, very impressive reconstruction, I think, of what Alexander's tomb might have looked like. So part of the idea of using these projections, which were kindly lent to us by Ubisoft, the creators of Assassin's Creed, um, is to show what, what uh, Alexander's story is still doing today. So it still lives on in computer games in this case. So they, uh, the researchers at Ubisoft have actually used other organizations such as the library to research what they think Alexander's tomb might have looked like and come up with really impressive um, graphics for their game. And those are what we have projected around our tomb. On the next slide, uh, you will see that we've also created a website. So why would we bother making a website when we have a wonderful exhibition space? Partly audience reach. So we know that a lot of people uh, can't make it to the library, which is a great shame for us, but we want to be able to offer something for those of you who are overseas or just can't make it during the time period that the exhibition's on. And that's very much what our Alexander the Great website is for. It allows us to address some of the challenges that are in the gallery. So I think nearly all of my colleagues mentioned that it's really, really hard to choose which page we're going to have open from a book. The website lets us have as many pictures as we want, and we can add pictures throughout the course of the exhibition. So at the moment, if you were to look at the website, we do have mostly only one or two openings from each item that we featured on the website. We will be adding more at the end of the exhibition. Um, it allows us to pull together all different content types. So we will be adding on our Faces of Alexander video that I mentioned at the beginning onto the website, but we also have um, lovely videos, one that features Adrian actually. Um, we've got articles that have been expanded on the themes that are in the exhibition. We have different collection types. We have little animations. Uh, so there, there's a lot more there than we could include in the gallery. And the wonderful thing about websites is there's no word limit. We do, I mean, we haven't just thrown every single word in the British Library at you on the website. We have kept to a nice limit. It is possible to read each of our articles in just a few minutes, but it does give us a chance to just tell you a little bit more than we could put into the gallery. 
And the other lovely thing about it is it's free to access. So anybody can get on there. You don't have to pay the entrance fee. It gives you a slight taster of what the exhibition's like, and it will hopefully either remind you of things that you've seen in the exhibition or encourage you to come and see it. And we all know in this day and age that it's it's everyone's a little bit strapped for cash. So this is our solution to that. So just to give you a nice little taster. And when the exhibition closes, the website will still be there. So it provides a sort of legacy space for the exhibition and the website, because it's attached to the British Library, will eventually be archived as part of the UK web archive. So it will now always be there. On the next slide, you'll see some of the things that we're doing with blogs and social media. So today it's, it's almost an intrinsic part of an exhibition to get on social media. Um, we use Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok now as well. I think we post to LinkedIn as well. Um, and that just allows us to be a little bit more playful with some of the items that are in the exhibition. Uh, the, the image in the middle of this slide actually um, suggests our idea of how you might get to work during one of the TFL strikes, uh, inspired by Alexander in his um, flying Wendy house. It looks a little like in his little flying machine. It gives us a chance to catch up with some of the creators who are featured in the exhibition. So we have um, we interviewed Ramina Yi, who is a, a graphic novelist who lives in Malaysia, but managed to come to see us in the exhibition. And we talked to her about what she finds important about Alexander and why she created a 21st century Alexander romance. And that you can find on our social media channels and also on our website. And we include blogs, which allows us to expand beyond everything that we've got in the exhibition. So we, we're talking about Alexander, but we can include some items that didn't make it into the exhibition, or we can go into more details about loans. So there's a, a lovely detailed blog, for example, about the suit of armor, pulling out lots of the pictures on the armor that we can't mention in the exhibition. On the next slide, you will see that we had some other challenges why items in the exhibition. So this, for example, is the Ebstorf map. It's huge. So there, that's the first reason that I chose it for work with um, an organization called Escape Studios. They are a college that um, specializes in interactive and real timing uh, education. So that means that I was able to get to work with 10 students from Escape to create a family friendly interactive. And we ran it as a summer project. And I asked the students to create me um, a more accessible version of the Ebstorf map. The Ebstorf map has over 2000 points on it. It was, was the world's largest um, world map, sorry, the largest world map from the middle ages. It was created in around 1300, but it was unfortunately destroyed in uh, 1943 by allied bombing of Hamburg. And that made this map particularly interesting to work with um, gaming technology because it's something that is now lost. And we were able to recreate an image of it um, from the facsimile that you can see on this slide and the facsimile that is printed um, at two meters by two meters and is on display in the gallery. Um, and we could use that as a basis to create a really lovely interactive 3D version of the map. And in that map, you can swoop in to the different sites that in this map that relate to Alexander the Great. So I said there are 2000 points on the map. About 19 of those relate specifically to Alexander the Great and the Alexander Romance. And we have used all of those in the game. So you can fly in and you'll get a little pop-up box. Um, you can see some of these on the next slide and you'll get a little bit of information about each object and it provides audio as well. And it's really family friendly. The brief I gave to the students was I wanted it to be able to be used within schools and it's free to download. Um, so it's, it's on our website. You can download it. Uh, we had some issues in that the Unreal Engine, which is what the students were specializing in, um, could only really easily run on Windows. So I think I'm afraid to say you'll have to use Windows if you want to use it. But we have, if you, if you are a, um, a non-Windows user, there are videos on our website so that you can just see the experience. And the interactive map, uh, the students chose to set the, 
the map itself that they've set on a table within their impression of what the nunnery in which the map was made might look like. So they, they did some research in our collections to try and find out what a medieval scriptorium might have looked like, which is the, the top image that you can see there. So the whole gaming experience starts with a swoop in through the room to find the map on the table. And this was very much inspired by the fact that we have the Assassin's Creed material in the exhibition. And so I'll hand over now to Adrian. Thank you, Iria. So if we look at the next slide, um, I've uh, put up um, some of the, the feedback and the figures associated with how the exhibition is going at the moment. Um, so it's a bit busy, but I'll just draw out the main thing. So, so tickets, um, over 20,000 tickets sold. Um, to that, there will be a considerable number of uh, group visit tickets, uh, schools visits, uh, children going for um, stories. So we don't know what the overall target is. I haven't been able to get that figure, but but we're, we're aiming for something like 35,000 visitors in all. Um, I think we're probably on target. Uh, we have had some excellent reviews, four or five stars, um, with the exception of the uh, first review from The Guardian. Uh, which gave us two stars, um, although next day we had a second review which, which seemed to like it, so yeah. Um, book sales, um, the 1,818 represents about 50% of the hardbacks that were printed and about 30% of the paperbacks. Um, interestingly, most of the hardbacks, 82% um, of them in fact, have been sold through the general book trade, not via our own BL shop. Um, so, so you know, through through local bookshops or through online um, major international online booksellers. Um, I'd say from the feedback on the left there, I've just just uh, typed up some of the comments. And um, people seem to like the exhibition. I'd say you know, it, 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 it's it's not nine out of ten. It, it's it's whatever it is, nine, ninety eight out of a hundred. People like the exhibition, both academics and the public, in terms of what they've told us anyway. Um, and I, there have been a couple of negative. I, I, it's really hard to find them. I, I put two there at the bottom just to give you a flavour of the kinds of things um, that, that people people have, have sure. said back. Um, as I said, the initial Guardian reviewer wasn't at all impressed with the basing of high quality medieval miniatures and Persian book arts alongside a selection of cheap comics, uh, paperbacks and other modern popular media. He made some interesting points. And I've seen that other gallery visitors uh, do like this combination and think that the message we're trying to make about how Alexander storytelling moves with the times um, from one medium to another um, you know, going, going from manuscript to print to, to, to comics and novels to television series and, and movies and onto video games. They thought that was um, a, a relevant, it seems to think it is a relevant point to have made. Um, final slide. Um, overall, uh, I think the four of us at least are, are happy with how the show is going. Um, if, you have, if you haven't seen it yet, please do come along. Um, the final weeks of the exhibition tend to be the busiest. Um, last Saturday uh, was in fact the busiest day in the gallery so far. So please do book in advance and we look forward to hearing what you think. Thank you very much. So I'll uh, hand back to Scott and uh, we're happy to take questions. That's great. Thank you all uh, for a really great insight into what it takes to put on an exhibition like this. It doesn't just happen. Uh, it happened through hard work and uh, a lot of expertise. So I think you've demonstrated that really, really well. Uh, I have received uh, one query, which is uh, sort of form of one I was going to ask you myself. So let me pose it. And if anyone wants to add a question, feel free and I'll uh, try and allocate them to one of the curators. So. The question is from Ian Gillett, and he asks, well, he starts, the majority of loan, loan items came from the UK and Ireland with the exception of the um, Great Venice loans. And he asks, what object or objects would you have liked to have been able to have included uh, had there not been the 
the issues of, of COVID-19. So Adrian, do you want to start with that? And maybe you can all speak. Oh, I, th I think we should all we should all uh, have have that answer that all separate this anyway. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Coming from from overseas, I'm not sure because of COVID. I, we we kind of didn't look as closely as we could have done. There are some really wonderful manuscripts. Um, for anyone that's been to the exhibition, you might remember when you um, at the very beginning. There's a, a printed book we borrowed from National Library of Scotland that has. Alexander and a portrait of Alexander with uh, boar's tusks. Um, it's a weird thing. Um, that 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 illustration, um, the woodcut, was actually is actually a copy of a um, of a manuscript illustration at uh, Darmstadt in Germany. And I think uh, in an ideal world, I would have liked to have seen the uh, the, the manuscript portrait rather than uh, borrow. Um, a, a, a printed book, which pains me to say, being a, paint, a printed book um, <laughs> expert. Can I just add one other thing? In, in terms of um, things that we would like to have borrowed, there was was something I, I would love to have borrowed: the um, Veronese painting of the family of Darius before uh, Alexander. Um, if you've been in the gallery, you know we we we, we got a, a very um, it's actually quite important a, a very little known uh, copy made by uh, George Frederick Watts of the same work. But the original is in the National Gallery. It's not very far away. It's enormous. Um, yeah, we couldn't borrow it because the bottom line is we don't have a doorway big enough at the British Library to be able to bring a painting of that size in. But I would have loved to have had that. Uh, both really good, really good. Uh, Ursula, something you 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 wish that could have been included. Well, um, I I would have I would have liked particularly there's there's a one of our manuscripts in the in the India section in in the India section um, is is showing um, is is showing. Uh, um yeah it's showing um alexander a copy of um the hamser of nizami and um the manuscript is broken up i mean we had this with the in the case which i don't with of um the chester Beatty manuscript and um our yates thompson manuscript illustrating the porous battle anyway that manuscript um is in the walters library it in um, Baltimore, and it would have been lovely to have it and to unite the manuscript together for the first time. But um, it wasn't possible. Well, I, I mean, we might have been able to borrow it, but in that case, um, expense was a great issue. And also um, the time involved in negotiating an extra loan overseas. We, we did try as far as possible to, um, to look as close to the library as we could for practical reasons. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of fantastic stuff in um, the UK, but um, yeah, no, that's that's interesting. Peter, uh, something you you long for that you couldn't include in the exhibition. There was a there is a nice uh, sculpture, a head of Alexander, in a UK private collection. Which is, um, which is an original Hellenistic piece, very little known. The first catalogue was published in the 20s and we approached the collection, but due to COVID, that was an effect of COVID. They didn't have the staff resources necessary to, to actually manage the, the landing of that item. So we had to give up on it, which was a sad loss because it would have been a nice uh, showcase for that item, which, is, which can be seen there in that particular collection, but not anywhere else. And it would have been a nice context for that item to, to be in the exhibition, an original sculpture from the Hellenistic period. Uh, well, we couldn't have it due to COVID reasons. So that was a, that was a sad loss. Very good. So, Iria, you've mentioned the Oliver Stone clip. Uh, were there other things you would have liked to have been able to include? Yes, and I suspect the reason for it not being included would have also been um, cost and rights, but um, mine is actually a piece of music, 
I think it would have made the most wonderful juxtaposition against the piece of Handel that we have. But there is a song called Alexander the Great by Iron Maiden. And I think it would have just been a wonderful um, opportunity to have the two of them side by side to show the two different extremes that Alexander can work to. Very good, very good. Uh, no, I haven't heard that one. So that, that <laughs> is interesting. Yeah. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, a different form, which is uh, more about what is in the exhibition. And I'm going to put each of you on the spot. Uh, it's the invidious, uh, which is your favorite child question. Uh, but uh, so who, who shall I, Ursula, which is your favorite item in? But can I cheat first? Because one of my absolutely most favorite items is, um, is the the book the story of Persephorest, which isn't which isn't Persian, um, about how Alexander the Great got on a boat to come back to go back to Babylon, and there was a storm, and guess where he woke up on Britain's shores, um, and that, that was very unexpected for me. But in terms of Persian items, I think. One of my most, one of my favourites is the one which I showed in the slide. I don't know if people could see it clearly, but of the Brahmins um, being interviewed by um, Alexander, Alexander the Great, dressed in his bling, frankly, and ev all the worldly accoutrements he could possibly have, contrasting with the Brahmins in their simple dress, wearing just sort of fig leaves, and it says in the text that they ate nothing but seeds and and covered themselves in leaves. And it's so such a graphic description. I think that's my favourite. Ask me tomorrow. I'll say something else. Very good. In fact, I've anticipated a question here from Annie. So, and she asks, I would love to know each of your favourite item in the exhibition or aspect or feature of the exhibition. So it's not just about an exhibit, but actual feature in the exhibition. So thinking about features of the exhibition uh, as well as exhibits. Uh, Peter, do you want to go next? I'm happy to. So there is a there is a, 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 a kind of an odd juxtaposition of two items in the exhibition I quite like. There is a beautiful Persian manuscript recording the legend of Alexander's uh, conquest of China as he is in battle with the champion of the Chinese emperor, who turns out to be a woman in disguise. <laughs> uh, and uh, there is a beautiful double opening in the manuscript showing uh, a, an extremely elaborate image of that battle. And we put uh, and and um, and the and the legend of Alexander's invasion or attempt to invade China is 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 specifically specifically Persian. We don't have it in any Western sources. And all of a sudden, we found an American comic book, which describes Alexander's attempt to invade China in the 1980s, uh, towards the end of the Cold War. And then it says, uh, introduced by the, the personification of death. Alexander is invading China, uh, where he is accepted quite favorably by the locals, but then he's turning to be too, too proud of himself, and they expel him with the, what they call the fire of the gods, which is the gunpowder. And uh, you can clearly see that uh, the political agenda behind this, and also behind the Persian, uh, the Persian um, image of uh, Alexander's invasion of China. And uh, we are sure that uh, the, the, the creators of the comic book should not have known about the Persian tradition of Alexander's invasion to China. But here we have two stories about the same thing, uh, the attempt to, to conquer China with completely different representations and completely different political agendas. And uh, this is the first time probably, maybe the last, that we can actually show the two next to each other. Yeah, no, that's a nice, nice thing because there are there are a number of these really nice juxtapositions throughout the show, or surprising juxtapositions in in several cases. So, Iria, um, fav favorite uh, item, favorite moment in the exhibition? Um, uh, like like everyone else, I think my favorite item changes each time <laughs> I'm in the gallery. Uh, I, I would currently be leaning towards um, the work by the artist Ramina Yi, whom I mentioned earlier. Um, so hers is actually, it's a 21st century retelling of the Alexander romance. 
but she's publishing it online, which is perhaps why I gravitate towards it. Uh, so it's, it's an online um, graphic novel and it's an ongoing publication, which makes it the most recent item in the exhibition, um, which is lovely because the oldest item in the exhibition was created in Alexander's lifetime. So we've gone to both, both um, extremes there. And it's, it's just a very gorgeous thing because Romina has looked at all the different um, versions of each tale that she can find and combined aspects from each to make her own version of the Alexander romance. And she's drawn inspiration from a lot of the manuscripts that are actually within our collections. So it's just, um, yeah, it's really lovely new telling of Alexander's story. Right, yeah. No, I mean, the, the chronological range as well as the geographic is amazing in, in the show. It's good to stress that. Adrian, uh, last but not least. <laughs> oh, oh, let me have two. Let me have two. Oh, all right. Two, two, two. You're allowed to. So there's a fun one. And that's the uh, comic of Alexander fighting Superman. Where uh, I think it's from 1983, you've got uh, one of Superman's adversaries, the Planeteer, who uh, one of his avatars of, of this Planeteer is Alexander the Great, and it's just the fact that that this 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 wicked villain uh, manages to uh, capture um, Leonard Brezhnev and uh, Ronald Reagan and uh, Margaret Thatcher. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's the evil side of, uh, of Alexander and Superman comes to the rescue. I just think that's just so bonkers. Um, but on a much more serious note, and actually something I got quite emotional about when I found it, I think the, the letter uh, from Mary Reynolds um, that, that we've got on display in the relationships area. So that's, that's about, um, about her novel, uh, The Persian Boy which, uh, you know, for a lot of people my age was a very influential novel. Um, and, and in this, this personal letter that, that I don't think anyone really had noticed before, certainly not, it's not mentioned in any of her bi biographies, um, she writes to her friend Cassia Abbott and she explains where the inspiration for The Persian Boy came from, from for the actual character, for Bagos, the, 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 uh, the slave boy. Um, and, you know, it talks about her... her it succinctly talks about her view on Alexander and his relationships. You know, the fact that Alexander's um, lovers were few, but constant. You know, it's, and that's one version of the storytelling. And what's so lovely about this exhibition is you can see other, other takes on Alexander. So that, that, that Alexander is a particular Alexander and one that I love. But, but you know, you, you, you see a red-blooded um, heterosexual Alexander when you look at the, the, the Persian stories. Um, with all these wives that he's 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 marrying and so forth, it's um, I think that's one of the lovely things about the exhibition is is just, there are just so many different Alexanders shown side by side, and they can't be reconciled. Great, good, 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 good. So I'm going to ask you one final question each, um, and I think it's about you talked. I think Iria, you were the one who talked about it, the sort of legacy. Um, of the show, and what, what what do you think is uh, for you from your point of view the principal legacy or the most important legacy of the show? Um, well, uh, Peter, this is not a, yet, but this uh, is a hard one. I yeah. think uh, uh, um, a long-standing legacy is probably the book. We are very very as I as I mentioned uh, in my bit of the presentation, this is probably the first ever exhibition targeting this very big task of collecting the storytelling and legends about Alexander the Great, which is very, very diverse and very complicated. It, it's like an entangled forest, and it's very hard to, to find your way around it. And uh, uh, we think that the book is actually a good way to sum up and collect many of these stories, some of them surprising, some of them very little known, some of them more uh, better known, and uh, the book is 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 giving a, sh a nice overview of the exhibition as a long-standing legacy of it, but also uh, has uh, nine essays devoted to various aspects of the show, uh, introducing the Alexander Romans, which was one of the the, the most important texts uh, of the legacy of Alexander, and. Uh, and, uh, it has various other texts about Alexander's relationships, uh, Alexander on medieval maps, 
So I think it, it constitutes a long-standing legacy and also a, a serious academic book, which could be consulted by many people in the future. Uh, so I think this is this is something that will stay on bookshelves and library shelves for a long time, and we are very very happy uh, uh, that it could that could that it could actually uh, appear, and we are very grateful for all the contributors to the book, including Scott and uh, many others. <laughs> very good, good, good. Um, so I'm just going to go and switch the light on, but Iria, do you want to uh, say what you think in terms of legacy? Sure. Um, so the thing that I think is important, Legacy, is not actually specific to this exhibition. It's something that is important for all of our exhibitions. But it's actually um, all the students and the, the children that we get coming in. So we're not, this isn't you know, aimed at children, this exhibition, but we do have a school programme running alongside it. And we have school groups coming in both primary and secondary, um, nearly every week. In fact, I think every week, several times a week. And um, in just two weeks time in the February half term, we have well over a hundred children coming in uh, to the building to experience some of the different storytellings going on around Alexander and his legends. And uh, the students that I worked with from Escape Studios, for example, none of them had ever been to the British Library or knew much about Alexander the Great or indeed his legends. Um, and I think it's it's that because we all remember a wonderful day from a, a day trip when you were a kid, either with school or with your friends or family. And you just think, oh, yeah, do you remember that we just did whatever? Or you just remember a story that you heard on that trip. And I think that's what this exhibition is doing. It's it's continuing the storytelling around Alexander and in this case to young children. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, great answer. Yeah, the influence of uh, that sort of experience can be life long, last your life, really. Um, so, Ursula, legacy. Uh, well, I, I think it. <clears throat> I think um, that the exhibition has been a wonderful opportunity to bring together um, so many different kinds of material. And, um, you know, I'm speaking as a, with my Persian hat on now. Um, most of the, the material, we have wonderful collection items and um, people know about it in the context of sort of Islamic art or, but not in this sort of general sense. And through the book, through the exhibition and through the book and the website, there will be an afterlife. Many, many people have come to me and said, oh, I had no idea that, you know, you had the same story in Persian as you have in Anglo-Saxon, you know, uh, uh, they're completely bowled over by it. And um, so, so we've, you know, they've, we're reaching out to far wider audiences than we maybe do in some exhibitions. And I think that it's going to have a lasting effect. People are, get, are already getting more interested and they're coming in and they're asking for photographs, digital copies and so on and one thing leads to another um, so hopefully um, we will really be reaching out and globally too not just in this country but um, all over the world. Right right yeah yeah no the, the continuing influence is sounds really great but, uh, and last but not least again Adrian sorry. Um, well on the academic side um, I think the exhibition has, has has brought academics from different fields together. So sort of building on what 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 Ursius just pointed out, really, you know, you, you've got the Persianists who are learning about you know, medieval European uh, storytelling, a, a modern storytelling, and I, I think getting academics that normally work in their own areas to to see right across and to think more more uh, cr more globally and across time as well. I think that might be one. But I think what I really hope is that um, Alexander perhaps has not got a higher profile in Britain, at least, as he has in some other parts of the world. And um, I think I'm, I'm hoping that he, we're raising his profile. Um, and as a result, that there'll be more creation, more creative writing, more, more novels, more um, graphic novels, more comics, more films, more television series, more everything really inspired by Alexander in Britain. That's one of the things I'd like to see. Right. Okay. 
So I'm going to wrap up now, I think. So it's a really big thank you on your behalf to the curators for really great insights into how you go about putting an exhibition together. And thank you to them for their, their passion and expertise. And a thank you to all of you for attending. If you've not already visited the exhibition, I hope you have been persuaded that you absolutely have to do so. Uh, don't leave it too long. As you see, uh, it only runs until the 19th of February. And as Adrian said, the best thing you can do is book in advance to avoid disappointment. So thank you all very much for joining us this evening. And I hope this has been inspiring and also an enjoyable experience. Thank you all.